Welcome to the Podcast Coins. I'm your host, Patrick McLean, and I'll be joined by a panel of experts. Sitting here today with Dan Held. How are you doing, Dan? I'm Nick Carter. My name is Bruce Fenton. My name is Bill Barheit. My name is Nelson Demiris. My name is Lou Kerner. We have Paul Brody. Here today with Roger Baer, known as Bitcoin Jesus. I'm Asif Herji. Eric Voorhees. Mark, how are you doing today? Alex Mashinsky. Anthony Scaramucci. And on this episode, we'll be discussing the birth of a global phenomenon, Bitcoin. Everything from the early players, the broken world that spawned it, and why it's so important. In the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, privacy concerns got the attention of what we now call the cypherpunk movement. The cypherpunks were those pioneering hacker vigilantes who advocated for a move away from traditional monetary banking systems to the digitally secured world of cryptocurrency. As society became increasingly driven by money and controlled by banks, it also became more entangled in the fiber optic technicals of the internet, which presented an opportunity for businesses to expand and commerce to flourish. But it also left the back door wide open to cyber criminals, making it possible for them to steal without ever having to pass a note to a bank teller or fire a shot. It also allowed financial institutions to tamper with transaction histories, for better or for worse. This new age problem created the necessity for a more private and secure way to do business, one that effectively cuts out the middleman, the banks. And it was out of this necessity and the forward-looking vision of the cypherpunks that led to the birth of Bitcoin. There is no doubt Bitcoin was born out of necessity and cunning genius. But who is the father, the mother, the creator of this seemingly unstoppable beast? Who is Bitcoin's Thomas Edison? Who are the grandmaster chess players who understood a true revolution only happens by taking back our financial freedom without asking permission? The answer might surprise you. The hero of this story, the inventor of Bitcoin, has no face, no physical address no digital footprint to track, only a name, Satoshi Nakamoto, here one day, whoosh, gone the next. I think at the end of 2008, uh, this paper hits the internet, it's about six pages, uh, it essentially describes Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Um, so this paper hits the internet as essentially world markets are crashing, yep. right? There was clearly a sentiment in the world, I think, that uh, as house prices were falling, as everyday people were losing their jobs, countries and, and currencies were collapsing, we were also bailing out uh, you know, private institutions yeah. like, like banks. So I think there was this really interesting opening, potentially, where people were willing to look at a new alternative like Bitcoin, yeah. right? which I think might have been a very small window to adoption. And it seems we had like, just enough spark uh, to have it begin to catch fire. If you look back at that period post global financial crisis, uh, you know we did give banks right that arguably had done really incredibly bad things, you know, committed fraud, committed price manipulations, uh, taken advantage of of all kinds of, of regulatory arbitrage to enriched themselves at the expense of, of the common person. And a lot of people lost a lot of money, to your point. And yet, instead of letting them fail, and instead of punishing, still nobody went to jail, uh, we bailed them out. And that definitely sat wrong with a whole segment of, of the population, uh, many of which are involved in, in the creation of, of Bitcoin. In 2008, when people saw, were really starting to talk about this financial crisis, and it was, it was much more apparent, and there was a lot of great voices like Ron Paul and other people talking about this, there wasn't many alternatives, but gold was one of them. So you had, that's where you had a lot of the gold bugs came from, including Peter Schiff and other people who were kind of from the, the Ron Paul sound money school. Uh, and there's other assets that you could buy, but there wasn't really an alternative to money or a store of value, certainly nothing like Bitcoin. He waited till the peak moment of despair in the financial crisis. October 31st, a few weeks before that, we had bank executives calling their wives 
to withdraw as much cash from the ATM as possible because they were worried about getting food. I mean, that's the stage that is set here. And so, so when Satoshi presses the send button on the white paper, he is planting Bitcoin at exactly the right moment, the exactly the right season for it to take root, for people to believe in it, for people to go, oh, I get why we need this. And if it had been 10 years earlier or 10 years later, people would be like, I'm not sure why we need Bitcoin. But he goes, this is the reason. And a couple statements of his, he talks about how the core root of the problem is with trust. We must trust in the banks. We must trust in the central banks. And that's what Bitcoin solves fundamentally is trust in the financial system, which that's how you build a new financial system is one without trust needed for interactions, which is incredible. Like my whole like mindset had changed. I said, we actually have money for the internet now. No one knows about it, except for, you know, a few, maybe a couple of thousand people have been paying attention. And this is going to change everything. Whether it's Bitcoin or eventually something else, I don't know. Because I haven't, it's unproven at this point. If this thing can even scale, if it can, can millions of people have this and still work, right? I had no idea. So when I spoke to some folks at, at the TED conference, which we all know as the TED Talks, I explained to them, you know, I've been enamored with this Bitcoin thing. And of course, the first question was, oh, what's that? And it was still at a point where the average person, even the average informed techie, really hadn't heard of it. And I explained it, and they said, let's talk about this some more. This is interesting. And so the folks at TED came back to me a few months later and said, would you mind giving a talk in the main stage about this Bitcoin thing and how it works? And I said, sure, but I don't think the audience is really going to be that enamored with the way proof of work works or consensus algorithms or, you know, whatever this stuff means in the background. But I think if you put it in the context of where money is going, I think it, it can actually lay the, the, the groundwork for what Bitcoin could ultimately mean. But the premise, what I thought was interesting, was to say, what if you could replace government-issued money, right, or the Federal Reserve, with the Internet itself? Now, most people even today think that's crazy. In 2012, people said, you know, Bill needed to figure out something to talk about, and he just made something up because he couldn't figure out what else to say. And that's not true. I mean, I, I literally believe that we're headed to a point where, where these Federal Reserve banks, our version, the European version, are going away because they don't add any value ultimately. And we can have a hard asset that actually maintains its worth over time. But the idea in 2012 that this Bitcoin technology, which was worth a few million dollars, could replace the Federal Reserve w was pure insanity. But I still decided that that was the best premise under which to introduce Bitcoin to the public. I mean, did you find, is this a social movement? All money is in itself a social movement. All money is sort of about trust and, and trust is about getting people to believe in things. And, and it's about people coming together around an idea. And, you know, I learned about the origins of paper money and, you know, the move away from gold or things of value to paper that isn't backed by anything. And why does that work? You know, why does the dollar work? It's, it's, it's not backed by anything other than a promise by the US government. And that promise by the US government though is enough to give people trust in the dollar or most people <laughs> give it trust, give most people trust in the dollar. There's obviously a growing crowd of people who don't have trust in the dollar. But um, I realized that all money is a sort of social network that's fundamentally based on trust and faith. And I think that, you know, seeing that, it, that sort of tie almost to these religious ideas, I started to understand why this was so compelling. You know, this is this thing that people believe in and come together around. And with Bitcoin, it had all of these elements that made people believe in it and that created this social network, even when they didn't understand you know, how a blockchain worked or how mining worked, they could still come to believe in this idea. And, you know, at the end of the day, Bitcoin succeeded because it got enough people to believe in it. At the end of the day, the software could work and all the hashing algorithms could work. And if nobody was interested in it, it would be worth nothing. It's, it's, it's a thing in the world because people believe in it, because people have faith in it, because a community has formed around it. 
And so what's interesting to me about Bitcoin is instead of asking us to build physical structures around piles of physical gold, right? Um, around a history of, of violence and coercion and a quest for dominance over natural resources. What Bitcoin asks us to do is separate the idea of money and state. And to me, Bitcoin really represents a cathedral for the modern age that is all about a digital world and the promises and guarantees made by cryptography and math. So instead of asking us to believe in empire, Bitcoin gives us an idea and asks us to believe in the verifiable proof of the Bitcoin network itself. And so being in the U.S. Mint, talking about the old U.S. Mint, talking about Bitcoin, I think is the perfect juxtaposition of the old world and the new. You know, we're surrounded by bricks and physical vaults to house gold and paper currency. And Bitcoin is this whole new paradigm, this whole new world. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, it's kind of like, um, you know, we see these old, these ancient old buildings that were used for a purpose that's not used anymore. You know, we're sitting in one of those now where we're seeing, as we talked about earlier, Bitcoins, you know, in terms of money evolving, this is the old money that's, that's dead and dying. And Bitcoin is this new money that's growing from it. So I turned them, when I saw the crypto light, what I really saw was there was now a new technology that I was unaware of that actually for the first time in history, we could now solve for the community. Up until then, the world has worked solving for the man in the middle, right? There's a guy who runs it and he generally solves for himself. That's what we all do, we're all human. Typically money in the regular world for most people is run by centralized institutions and important people in fancy offices who sort of whimsically decide through these uh, you know, crazy metrics that they use, they decide how much money there's going to be and ultimately what the value is, uh, or, or at least they try to, and oftentimes they fail. For a lot of people, for me, Bitcoin is money. And my money is controlled by the laws of math and the code that it, that's written and the code that we agree to run if we, if we run that Bitcoin code. You know, sitting in this money is data landscape, uh, I want to kind of dive in to the different elements of money is data. So I think digital currency, which will be in a centralized fashion. And then we have the other side, things like Bitcoin, money is data that are a decentralized fashion. So can you explain the difference between those two? And then I want to kind of go down the path of why is decentralization important? Yeah. Most people don't realize that all money today is digital already. All the dollars that you use, all the euros that you use, all the yen that you use is all digital. There is a tiny exception, which, that is, which is that some small percentage of those currencies are printed as paper tokens, but they are paper tokens of the digital fiat currency. Something like 97 or 98% of dollars are just digital entries in a bank account. So the reason that Bitcoin is unique is not because it is digital. It's a digital currency, yes, so is the dollar. What makes it unique is that it is scarce. There are only 21 million that can ever be created and that it is decentralized, uh, which means that it operates on a global peer-to-peer -peer network that nobody controls. No nation controls it, no politician controls it, no corporation controls it, and no single person or group of people control it. Um, unlike the dollar, which is centrally controlled by the US government and by the Federal Reserve Central Bank, which has uh, all sorts of restrictions and borders on it, which is used as a tool of political power, the main difference here is that you, the, the world is now presented with an alternative. They can either choose to keep using a centrally controlled, centrally planned digital currency with unlimited supply and which could be stolen from you at the stroke of a, of a button on a keyboard or a subpoena from some agency, or a decentralized digital currency that is borderless, has a limited supply, and if you use it correctly, cannot be stolen from you by anyone in the world, regardless of how powerful they may be. Uh, personally, I choose the latter, and I think the rise of Bitcoin is essentially evidence, empirically, that more and more of the world is choosing the latter as well. And uh, I think that's where we are today, is we're at a point where the desire to have something different than currencies which can be devalued um, has created the need for and the presence of, of this new thing, which is what I believe led to the creation of Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency, different from a fiat currency, because a cryptocurrency has a finite 
supply different from a fiat currency, which can be created at will. I think all humans want to preserve value. I think at the end of the day, people work hard for their money and they're going to go search to figure out how to preserve it. Is the topic complex? Sure. I mean, how many people know how their existing money works? But that's the beauty of Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin's monetary policy is easier to understand than the US dollar. It's 21 million Bitcoin, that's it. I know that that's going to be scarce. And I know that more and more people will demand to hold that. Whereas the dollar, I know there's almost infinity that will be printed over time. And it's an easy scarcity sort of calculation for people. They don't, you know, people turn on their microwave, they use their car, and they don't really think about how it works. They just know the basic principles of why it's valuable to them. And so I don't think with Bitcoin they have to fully understand exactly how a blockchain works or anything else like that. They just need to know what value it brings them. And for Bitcoin, it's like a digital gold. You're able to store value in it. It can't be seized from you and you can transmit it anywhere you'd like. The vision behind Bitcoin was actually, I think, fairly simple, which is we must have, or there's a role for, a system of storing, storing value and making payments that cannot be politically influenced, that can't be changed, right? That, that is absolutely verifiable and trustworthy. And it emerged at a time where not only were we making big advances in computing, but we were also in a period of significant economic crisis where people were looking at banking systems, government entities, and asking, can we really trust them? Are they transparent enough? So Bitcoin emerged in that environment, and it was a very specific response to concerns about transparency in banking and the reliability of government entities to preserve the value of a financial asset. I think in, in, in what you wrote, you had listed four or five different attempts to kind of build the digital currency yeah. through this same group. Uh, do you mind kind of walking us through that a little bit? Yeah, you had Wei Dai, who created B Money, Adam Back, who created Hash Cash, uh, Nick Zabu, who created Bitgold. Um, you had Hal Finney, who did uh, usable proof of work. Um, and then you had uh, David Chom, who did, uh, oh, I forget exactly what he did, but he did, it, uh, I, think, I think it was called like eCash. All of these guys came together and tried to create, they, they took all this genetic code, if you will, to create this new species of money, but they all died on the operating table. It never survived. And so Satoshi's brilliance was he took all these failed attempts, spliced some of the DNA from each one, Frankenstein it together, and it survived and worked. He figured out the magic sauce. If you think about money, if I have electronic money, and I want to send you a dollar, I could just make a copy and send you that. Well, now we're both criminals, right? Now we've done counterfeiting and money laundering, and that's bad. Well, where Bitcoin has its roots, as you go all the way back, there was this gentleman, Tim May, you know, God rest his soul. And in 1988, he wrote the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. Okay, it's only a couple pages, but it laid out everything that was gonna happen over the next 30 years, from the creation of digital currency, to their government response, that they would hate it, to the corporate response, that they would hate it. Now what's interesting is that the same year, 1988, The Economist put a picture of a global currency called the Phoenix and said it would happen in 2018. It's pretty amazing, you know, bold forecast, 30 years ahead. And they were off, not by very much, uh, but we don't call it the Phoenix, right? We call it Bitcoin. Now what's interesting is it took 20 years until 2009 uh, for Satoshi-san, whoever he, she, they are, to create Bitcoin. And then last year, Scientific American says Bitcoin is the future of money. Pretty amazing. And it's because what happened is Satoshi solved this double spend problem. That if I have a physical electronic form of money, there were lots of attempts, right? In digital cash and e-cash, but you could still make a copy. Well, we needed something to allow us to send an original and only the original. You know, at the, at the root, Bitcoin works because you can't spend money that's in somebody else's wallet. You can't double spend a Bitcoin. And so the technology has made it so that's more or less impossible. The idea of Keynesian economics is basically that every dollar that gets created is at the expense of every dollar that already exists because it's not backed by anything, right? So your wealth is basically being inflated to zero. It's kind of counterintuitive, right? But it's being inflated to zero because the, the purchasing power of the dollar goes to zero over time. 
Austrian economics says the opposite. You create a fixed amount of a currency, and therefore, by definition, its purchasing power should go up over time, right? And which is what we have in Bitcoin, by the way, but we'll come back to that. So now, the second problem goes back to my Netscape days, where you had this, uh, you know, first example of, of, of a digital currency called DigiCash, where, where it failed because you had to trust DigiCash. The reason you had to trust DigiCash was that if two people had a copy of the same currency, the only way to prevent both of them through for spending this currency was to go through a central trusted third party. That's ultimately why it failed, because there was no benefit to trusting them versus trusting the government. You're still trusting someone else. The holy grail is, what if we both had a copy of the money, but only one of us could spend it with no trusted third party? And in my world, we call this the double spend problem. And for decades, we all assumed that the double spend problem was unsolvable. Right? And the reason we thought it was unsolvable was because it never occurred to us that we could use every computer in the world to solve the problem. Right? Now, that's crazy. But if you think about it just in terms of solving the problem, right? Bitcoin is the most inefficient transaction processing system ever created. But it wasn't created to be efficient. It was created to eliminate that trusted third party to solve the double spend problem. If you think about it only in those terms, it makes perfect sense. But again, nobody ever thought of it in those terms before, at least not before uh, Satoshi you know, did to solve the problem. Well, I, I looked at Satoshi's paper uh, back in 2010 and thought it was the dumbest idea ever. I mean, the, the waste of electric power and computing power and communication, this giant network that needed to coordinate between all the nodes I mean, it was just like completely crazy to me. I'm a, I'm an efficiency freak. I right? like, I'm like, let's go from 4G to 5G. Let's uh, get the speed 10x, right? Let's get the internet running faster. So wasting a tremendous amount of electricity to create the world's slowest database was not my idea of moving forward, right? So I completely missed the con the idea behind the double spend or what how big of a problem that was solving. What is Bitcoin mining? Yeah, it's kind of a foreign concept to most people, but effectively the security of the protocol, the ability to transact on an ongoing basis and have confidence that that transaction is going to settle, that is maintained by a network of nodes globally, um, which are run by industrial entities that effectively sacrifice energy to prove that they've done some computational work and for that effort, they're rewarded with new coins and with transaction fees. And because they've undertaken this effort, they've incurred this cost, their incentive is to behave well, such that the coins, their reward, uh, are worth something, right? If the miners misbehave, the coins they get are gonna be worthless because Bitcoin would fail if they, you know, f if they stopped sort of doing their job correctly. And so that's the economic incentive that powers the Bitcoin system. So Bitcoin is not just protected by cryptography, it's also protected by economics. Uh, and so that's the, basically the concept of mining. Um, do you mind describing in your words like a little bit more in detail, like what is the happening in Bitcoin? Yeah, so, so Bitcoin is a, a protocol that's been written basically back in uh, 2008 and launched in 2009. And in the protocol, right into the code, it's written that every four years, uh, the amount of Bitcoin rewards, the amount that the network pays the miners, the people who basically secure the network, uh, gets cut by half uh, every four years, right? So that's just, there's nothing that can stop that. And what's happening is that, that basically um, every time there is, the amount gets cut by half, uh, uh, the amount of supply and the amount of new Bitcoin being created gets cut by half as well. And because of that, basically the inflation of Bitcoin or the amount of new Bitcoin that hits the market uh, gets decreased dramatically. So it's the opposite of what the Fed is doing every day. When the Fed prints $1.9 trillion because everybody in America needs to get a, a check, right? A COVID check, uh, it inflates the amount of money. It increases the amount of money by 20% or whatever the amount is, right? Bitcoin does the opposite. Bitcoin continuously lowers the inflation. Like right now, 
I think the inflation of Bitcoin is just below 3%, which is obviously a very small number. And in about three years or three, three and a half years, it's going to be cut by half. So it's going to be something like one and a half percent. And that decrease in supply uh, basically is part of the com complete plan of having only 21 million Bitcoin over the life of the, of the entire protocol. So, so it's a limited supply coin uh, that has its own progression and has its own kind of uh, monetary system that again is the opposite of what central banks are doing in Japan and Europe and the United States where they're just printing more and more and more money pretending like none of that means anything like there's nothing bad that's going to happen if we're printing trillions of dollars and uh, you know air dropping it on the American population then you have this idea of there could finally be a solution to the double spend problem right which is this combination of Bitcoin's blockchain and proof of work system which basically say it doesn't matter who has a copy of the keys to the money only one person will be able to spend it it's unbelievable bitcoin changes all of that so now when i first saw it in 2010 whenever i first read the white paper i think it was like three or four months after it was released at first i said i think i think this guy thinks he thinks that he's solved the double spend problem that's crazy and I, I kind of said, I, there's something about this that I'm not understanding. Because he seems to think that he's just going to put computers all over the world. And these computers are going to play a game and solve this double spend problem. I said, that's crazy. So I put it aside. And it kept gnawing at me. Because I was running another payments company at the time. And that payments company was doing cross-border money transfer for migrant workers, remittances. Basically, uh, effectively, poor migrants sending money back to their families. The problem in running in that business is, is the... The work you have to do to put money transfer licenses and remittance centers in place all over the world is so much work. And then it finally, you know, it dawned on me a few months after I read this paper, you know, if this Bitcoin thing, whatever it's called, actually works, in theory, you could do person-to-person cross-border money transfer between Mexico and the United States, and, or the United States and Haiti, where I just started a foundation after the earthquake, to send money home effectively for free with no trusted third party. And people could do it directly from a phone. You know, the poor, the poor maid from the Philippines who's working in the Middle East, and, and you know, he or she is sending um, funds back to their family, they're, they're, they're probably getting charged somewhere between 20 and 30% when you really think about all of the fees that they, they, they bear to, to from, this, to, from where it started to, to, to the time it gets their family. And that's, that's outrageous. Like, sending money should be no more expensive than sending an email. And it doesn't have to be. And, and, and blockchain really can do that and is doing that. And now we basically have a system where we can say, well, wait a minute. Not only is this a better way to pay, it's a better money itself because it's effectively doing for us what gold used to do. The dollar, when it was based upon a gold standard, had, had a guaranteed size of its float. In other words, we knew the government couldn't simply print more money without first finding more gold in the ground to give that money its value. Today, we don't do that. The government is simply allowed to print as much money as it wants, and it just loans the money to itself and effectively doesn't have to pay it back, right? So, so Bitcoin changes all of that. So you want to talk about Bitcoin as a, as a species and, and that it has a, a DNA of sorts. Uh, do you mind talking about that and, and how you see those building blocks? Yeah, so just like how species have genetic code, Bitcoin has computer code, and that code inscribes certain traits that Bitcoin has as a money, just like different species have different traits. And as we've seen with evolution, species that have advantageous traits over time survive, thrive, and outperform and outcompete the other types of species who don't have those advantageous traits. So Bitcoin, as a new species of money, has much more advantageous traits than gold, than fiat money, aka government money. And some of those, you know, for example, if we look at gold versus Bitcoin, Bitcoin is easily divisible down to one one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin versus gold. I can't shave off a little gold flake to go pay for a, a piece of bread. Um, and you've also got verifiability. Bitcoin's easily verifiable from your phone versus gold. You have to have a very expensive spectrometer to go measure it. Um, and then you've also got in you've got auditability. So Bitcoin's total money supply. And I think this is a very important part of this 
Bitcoin's money supply is auditable, where I can go with my, with my phone or a home computer, audit Bitcoin's entire monetary policy. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin, and I can go and check the network to see exactly how many Bitcoin exists today. With gold, we have no idea how much gold exists. We can approximate it, but we have no idea. And we don't know how much gold will exist. Same with dollars, euros, yen. We kind of know how many dollars are around today, and we definitely know that there will be a lot more around tomorrow. So in all, you know, to summarize this, Bitcoin as this new species of money, this new cryptocurrency, has advantageous traits compared to these older forms of money. And species kind of brings this all to a head where, you know, what happens when Bitcoin competes with these other forms of money? Who will survive? Got it. And, and uh, you also mentioned uh, censorship resistance. Do you mind diving into that trait? Sure. Yeah, so censorship resistance would be the ability to move this money without it being censored. Gold and Bitcoin have that uh, characteristic because they are uh, a bearer asset. When I hold it, I have complete control over it. For example, if I hold a gold bar, I can go sell that gold bar and I can transfer it to anyone I'd like. Same with Bitcoin. The network doesn't censor any transaction, so I can send it to anyone in the world. Uh, there's no politics, no other layers I have to go through to go send that. Whereas existing government money has this intense amount of bureaucracy where I think we've all probably had a payment that's been frozen for some reason or another. Do you find any traits that Bitcoin has that are not applicable or not possible with, with other forms of payment or currency? Yeah, well, gold versus Bitcoin is a very particular one around transportability. I can't send you a piece of gold via an email. You know, that's, a, that's an inherent fundamental flaw with gold. We live in the digital world. I, I'm 33, and when I grew up, I grew up with cassette tapes. And now we've got streaming music. So I was one of the last uh, age cohorts to go from the analog world to, to the completely digital one, or mostly digital one that we have now. Bitcoin was inherently built for this new modern world that is digital now. Um, now, of course, that's not Bitcoin's main characteristic that is digital. It's a money that was inherently created for the internet, and due to how Bitcoin's been created, it is completely separate from any control by governments, and that's what makes it so valuable. So as we've seen with evolution, species that don't have advantageous traits to be competitive end up dying and fading away. That, still, that applies to money as well. Government money and gold have inherent flaws where Bitcoin is much more advantageous than, than those two forms of money previously. So the likelihood of this outcome is that Bitcoin will be the predominant apex predator of money it will become the money, the predominant money in this world due to those advantageous traits it has. And um, I think this analogy works really well with people because most people don't think about money as competitive. They have their government money and that's it. But all money is competing. All government money is competing with each other and same with gold and government money and Bitcoin. Bitcoin is now, becoming to, is now taken seriously as a competitor against these other uh, traditional currencies, whereas before Bitcoin was so small, it was considered more niche and hobbyist, but we're having the whole world wake up to the reality that Bitcoin is a serious contender. I mean, do you think there's a purity to the fact that Bitcoin was developed at a time when no one knew if there was going to be an economic value to it? You know, uh, not necessarily going into Satoshi's mind, but you know, would it have been? Is there, is there something about that that distinguishes it from other cryptocurrency projects by virtue of it being the first and created in this almost vacuum of a space? For sure, Bitcoin was sort of created with this kind of immaculate conception. Nobody knows who the founder was, and it was released publicly for anybody to participate in, and it was very fair. There was virtually no speculation. There was certainly no exchange or market where somebody could buy it and sell it and pump it or anything like that. It was just code given away, and a few tiny, tiny number of people were interested in it, and they started running it, and it grew from a few people to a few more and a few more. So it was a very fair, uh, an anonymous and unusual way that would be extremely difficult to duplicate now. But he really needed to set it up permanently for a, a successful experiment, a successful launch of this new money. And in gardening, he has to figure out how to pass on Bitcoin to the community. He can't remain a single founder because then he will always be a weak point in the protocol. He will always be someone that could be, even if he's pseudonymous, he would represent too much power, too much control. And that's Bitcoin's core purpose is to decentralize and to have that control be distributed. And so Satoshi does something very surprising here. He starts to work with other developers. Uh, they develop a good process. 
a lot of people start contributing to Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has, you know, the, the seed has been planted, it's starting to grow. It's a small tree now. And he walks away. And he walks away pretty abruptly um, with basically just like two lines and then no one ever hears from him again. And I think it's, it's a very poetic way to go. It's a very, uh, I think the only appropriate way to go rather than a long lengthy explanation as to why he realizes that he's the core weak point to Bitcoin. Satoshi was worried that, as he, as he says, the hornet's nest has been kicked. And he was worried that Bitcoin's you know, small tree might get, get, get crushed. The storm could come and crush it. And he realizes that he's a weak point in that. And so he removes that weak point from the system by leaving. And he feels confident enough in the community to keep it going. And he realizes, it's kind of like a parent realizing like your, your child has to go out and make their own way in the world. You can't shelter them for forever. And that's how he feels about Bitcoin. It's in the appropriate spot to leave it on its own in its own community. And so he walks away forever. And we've never heard a word from him since. I knew without any doubt whatsoever people were gonna start using it as money, but there were no tools to enable that to happen. There were no smartphone apps. There weren't uh, payment processor tools. There, wasn't, there weren't tools where you could accept it as payment on your website easily. None of it existed yet. It was just basically an idea at that point. And all there was was the full node software that you could have to run on your computer and that would act as, a, as the wallet. So the, step, the next step there was to start hiring software engineers and developers and, and investing in businesses to build the iPhone apps, to build the Android apps, to build the payment processors, to build all the tools to actually make it easy for people that weren't computer scientists with you know, PhDs uh, to be able to use Bitcoin as money. And today it's pretty darn easy. Anybody that downloads an app on their smartphone can now start sending and receiving any amount of money with anyone anywhere in the world instantly basically for free and there's nothing that anybody can do to stop it. That's a really, really powerful tool for all of humankind that, uh, that raises the standard of living of all of humankind because the more pe people can trade with each other around the world, the better off they all become because anytime anybody trades anything with anybody voluntarily, both people are better off after the trade happens. Otherwise, the trade wouldn't have taken place at all. And so the more tools we can build to enable people to trade with other people, the faster uh, the world becomes a better place for everybody that's involved in, the, in that trading. And one thing that most people today won't know about, but in the early days, in maybe 2012, one of the biggest criticisms of Bitcoin was, well, Bitcoin, what can you buy with it? If you can, we could buy some drugs on the dark net and that's it. Well, I solved that problem by launching a website called BitcoinStore.com, where we listed more than half a million consumer electronics products for big sale for Bitcoin at my cost, right? I, I partnered with uh, the largest and the third largest uh, consumer electronics distributors in the United States, and we sold their entire inventory line card uh, for Bitcoin at cost. So that means most of the products were actually cheaper than Amazon, cheaper than Newegg, cheaper than Tiger Direct, and we sold millions of dollars of these products for Bitcoin, and it totally changed the narrative in the media because at that point, people would say, well, what can you buy with Bitcoin? You can say you can buy just about anything. How did governments initially react in those early days to this new currency? Probably in the earliest days, they ignored it. <laughs> and then um, when they first heard about it, I think it, it was pretty much like you see now, a, a combination of reactions from, from overreactions or attempts to ban it to misunderstanding to just kind of letting it go or, or, uh, or ignoring it or not even understanding it. So are they misinformed or are they acting maliciously? They talk their own book. Like, uh, you know, when, when you watch CNBC and you usually watch the people, the anchors and the people they interview talk their own book. They, they say great thing about this company or about that product or an ETF. Here, the same thing is happening with the Fed and with Treasury, right? They talk their book. Their book is 100% denominated in US dollars. So anything that is not running in US dollars is in effect a threat to that uh, uh, reserve system, right? So uh, uh, Bitcoin is the best performing asset in 12 years. Uh, it's been the best performing asset against any uh, commodity and any stock, any bond, almost every year for the last 12 years. And, and the fact that it's moving so fast, uh, it's a parabolic move every time. Uh, uh, is something that is not under the control of the Fed. The Fed and Treasury cannot uh, put a, uh, uh, a chain or lock down a Bitcoin, right? They have no uh, control over it whatsoever. So, 
So I think uh, uh, they view it as a, something that is threatening their dominance in the financial system. Do you think the community is prepared to be vilified for something that they care about? Yeah, Bitcoiners have been vilified since the very beginning. So certainly we are used to hearing these arguments that um, we're all just a bunch of money launderers. I mean, that's been levied against the Bitcoin community since the very beginning. Uh, I think it's been levied so long against so many people that are clearly good people that it's starting to lose its effectiveness. And um, as people as people use this system and try it out and realize that, oh, actually, this is just a really incredible tool, then the, the arguments that those who use it are bad people will be less and less effective. The CIA was interested in Bitcoin in 2010 when the price was, you know, like less than 10 cents per Bitcoin. They invited the, the lead developer for Bitcoin at that time, Gavin Andreessen, to go and uh, present on Bitcoin uh, to them. And so if the CIA was interested in 2010, we have to ask ourselves, why were they interested? Well, if you have a magic money printing machine where you can print as many dollars at any time you want and the entire world just blindly accepts uh, using those dollars, and now there's this new technology coming out where maybe people won't have to use dollars as money anymore and it's gonna make your magic money printing machine not useful anymore because people won't want your dollars, you would do everything you possibly could to disrupt that magic uh, uh, tool of Bitcoin to dis from disrupting your magic dollar printing machine. And maybe that's what happened. Maybe that's where we are today. And maybe that's why uh, people today don't even claim that Bitcoin's supposed to be a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash for the world. They claim it's just supposed to be a store of value and you better obey everything the politicians say in regards to it. And uh, that's the exact opposite of what Bitcoin was all about in the early days. It was this magical tool to enable every single human being to have complete control of their own money, despite what the politicians say, not because of what the politicians say. I think the early community in Bitcoin is immensely important, and I think it's important for people who care about Bitcoin to understand its origins, which were very much political. It was a political movement, and it was launched in politics, and it was discussed as a political thing, and almost all of the early uh, participants and supporters had very strong political leanings. Whether somebody likes that or not, or agrees with those po politics now, I think it's important to know that it, it very much is and was a political movement, and we can see that a lot by looking at those very early days. The reason that people should care about Bitcoin specifically, or digital currencies generally, is that it is a technology that the entire world can use for commerce and industry and economic exchange. No one has privileges in this system more than anyone else. It is equitable, it is fair, it is open for the entire world regardless of who you are or where you live. If you believe that a system of money should be based on that as a principle, then you should care about Bitcoin. If you believe instead that money should be controlled by governments, should be censored based on the whims of politicians, should be un unavailable to certain people in the world or certain entire countries just based on who they are or where they are, then Bitcoin is not going to be interesting to you. If you believe that individuals should be empowered with their own economic decisions, if you believe that people have a right to choose how they exchange with one another, you should care about Bitcoin. If you believe that a government should oversee and manage everyone's economic exchange, then you should not care about Bitcoin and you should be quite afraid of it. And so it's a fundamental shift. Um, but again, I think Bitcoin is a fantastic, as I call it, a money battery, because it allows us to take um, two, two inputs, semiconductors in the form of ASICs and electricity, which powers those ASICs, and convert them into monetary value. And the promises that are made by Bitcoin are promises that are not dependent on a state. They're not dependent on a group of individuals. They're purely dependent on a global network consisting of millions of people running millions of these ASICs in facilities all over the world and millions of people who hold Bitcoin and work on Bitcoin's core code repo and build applications on top of Bitcoin. And that I think is a fundamentally different vision. I think the question I then ask after that is, you know, are we reaching a point, a tipping point, where we see the end of the experiment known as the nation state? Mm -hmm. And how does this new digital state that's been created by Bitcoin, where literally a group of people on the internet who memed a new type of money into existence, um, how does the existence of this new type of community that has economic power, 
how does that mesh with this historical construct of a nation state that's been defined by physical borders, stockpiles of gold, and an army that wages war, not only in physical violence, right. but financial violence is the predominant form of violence in our world today in the form of sanctions and economic policies. And, and, I wanna... and so I think, again, what's so critical about Bitcoin is in Bitcoin, we separate state and money, mm -hmm. right? Bitcoin's guarantees are encoded in the Bitcoin protocol. That protocol cannot be changed by any one entity or any one group. Now in Bitcoin's history, people have tried to do that. Right. We've seen conflicts in the Bitcoin ecosystem where certain people have tried to push the protocol in certain directions and to implement changes to the protocol. But again, the checks and balances that are introduced in Bitcoin between code and developers the miners themselves who operate the physical Bitcoin network and Bitcoin holders have resulted in an outcome um, that preserves the original intent of the Bitcoin protocol. So to me, when people think about the dollar and the promises they associate with the dollar, those promises are increasingly worthless. And so when we think about what gives money value and sort of enduring uh, value, to me, Bitcoin really fits in a very unique place in this moment in history. Would you say that early Bitcoin can be considered a success story? Rem removing it from the history of where it's you know, ended up or where it is today, looking at those early years, would you say that Bitcoin was a success? Yeah, I think it was a, it was a great success because it, it, once you have an idea that gets into people's heads, you, it's very hard to kill that. You can't uh, bomb it out of them. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. The idea is there. And people have an idea about better money and something that can work better and make the world better, and then that spreads. And it just continued to spread and spread and spread. And some percentage of those people end up being true believers. And that's the real core of what we have that's become this huge mov movement that totally aside from price and the economics, it has changed the way people think and it's changed uh, lives and the way that people uh, think about money. Now, technology has impacted financial services for the better a lot, right? So if you go back to Internet One, where we went from mainframe computing to distributed computing, one of the biggest things it did was it pushed the application onto a PC and made things a much more self-service. This is why you had direct banks and direct insurers and direct, you know, online everything, right? Ameritrade wouldn't have existed without that kind of a shift. The next wave that came along where we went from di distributed to mobile cloud, again, a decade of innovation, great companies got built, and it pushed out the application even further to the end. And now it was more convenient. You didn't have to have a, a, a PC in a web browser. You could actually do it on your phone. And you could do things that you couldn't normally do, like push a button and a car shows up, right? Now we're into the third wave. And the third wave is where we're going from mobile cloud to decentralized. And this is much different from the prior two waves, because the prior two waves pushed the application out further and further to the end user. Now we're actually addressing the data. For the first time, we're actually decentralizing the actual data. And that has a profound effect on financial services because a lot of financial services, all those intermediaries get paid for the function that they do because they provide a level of trust in the transaction. Right? So I, I, I may not trust you, but I trust your credit card <laughs> right? because your bank stands behind it. Okay? And so the bank gets paid a fee to do that. Now, the, the, the blockchain based applications that are coming and will continue to come over the next decade, I think there's going to be a lot of innovation, will fundamentally re-alter the way that financial transactions work. And it'll take a lot of these intermediaries out and so it'll crash the costs of financial transactions. Bitcoin was not launched as a piece of technology, it was mm -hmm. launched as a social movement. Right. There were deliberate design choices that were made in how Bitcoin was distributed, the message that was imprinted in the first block that was mined, right. even the way that Satoshi chose to sort of uh, create this this mystery around their identity and then to disappear right? it has elements of a social movement or a religious movement in it and there are very inherent elements of sort of philo philosophy it's not just a technology and so absolutely there's sort of core values that power bitcoin which have to do with the respect for property rights not having oligarchs or elites that are you know able to extract value from the protocol those values are actually reflected in the technical reality and so I think we absolutely do have to be mindful of them uh, as we you know, progress through development. So yeah, I have a very definite vision for what Bitcoin should be. 
Um, and I think it's one that's shared by, by most Bitcoiners. At the end of the day, let's say that everybody's wrong about it being a store of value or it's going to be the money of the future. It is a collectible to a lot of people. Look at what's going on in the non-fungible token space. Bitcoin, there's only 18-ish million coins, uh, several of which have to be, several million left that need to be mined, but a couple million coins disappeared. So, you know, you've got 46 million global millionaires in the world, according to JP Morgan. You don't even have enough Bitcoins for each millionaire in the world to own one coin. So just imagine the fury around owning this collectible asset as well. Don't worry too much about understanding all of it. You don't know how your car works. You don't know how your microwave works. You don't know how your existing money works. Learn why it's valuable for you and learn some of the basics, but don't try to learn all of it right away. Put a little bit of money in to try it out, get comfortable with it. And then from there, go down the rabbit hole of, of learning more. And then as you become more and more trusting of it, decide to put more into it. You are on the verge of making one of the greatest financial decisions of your lifetime. But not only just your lifetime, Bitcoin might be one of the most valuable investments ever in human history. And we're on the precipice of, of governments printing trillions of dollars per week. Bitcoin only has 21 million. That's the basic value prop. What do you want to store your wealth in? Do you want to store it in something that's continually being uh, devalued or stored in something that is uncompromising, unchanging and trustworthy? Now that Bitcoin has been birthed into the world, our next episode will discuss the first major use of it, the creation of the global internet drug trade. I'm Patrick McLean, and this is the Podcast Coins.